Shane and welcome to the Geek Events Talk Show where we a bunch of friends gather together and discuss on certain topics yeah so well uh, in this episode i want to talk about something very cool that uh, my friend aditya and i had a discussion on and i look i thought like this will be a really interesting topic to talk about uh so well as applications grew right and as uh, there were products in the market uh, we all uh, servers and virtual machines came into play right and i'm pretty sure we all of us have studied what servers virtual machine and virtualization is right in engineering so virtualization basically for the people who don't know it's a process where we can use a common infrastructure to set up multiple operating system right so we have a common hardware with the help of an hypervisor right which acts which helps to enable virtualization we can set up you know different operating, operating systems system. on which we can have our application mm -hmm. right so this was the industry standard uh, of virtualization in our industry for quite some time yeah. but uh, just because it's industry standard doesn't mean there's no room for improvement since we humans also involve tech also involve evolves right so there were certain issues with this uh, uh, in certain use cases there were certain issues with virtualization and virtual machines uh, being that uh, you know uh, it was too big of an infrastructure and suppose if i have a virtual machine in which i have my application you now this application could not be moved mm -hmm. right because it was os dependent right so uh, to help overcome this the concept of containerization was born now before you guys jump to the word docker let me tell you that the word uh, when people say containerization people usually tend to think docker but that's not the thing docker was the first to provide the docker engine in 2013 which led to the industry standard containerization containerization applications mm -hmm. right yeah. uh, so with that i <coughs> guess uh, you people have sort of a clue what we'll be discussing on and we'll be discussing in this episode about containerization and containers and to help me and help you guys learn and educate a bit about it i'm joined with my beloved friends aditya hi aditya welcome back to the talk show so can you please tell me uh, what is containerization and containers in general yeah so shlok as you said that it becomes difficult for an application to move from a particular virtual machine to another or to a different mm -hmm. environment mm -hmm. environment so this is where containerization comes into picture mm -hmm. basically containerization is a concept mm -hmm. wherein you know we package an application mm -hmm. along with all its libraries its mm -hmm. frameworks uh -huh. its system level dependencies mm -hmm. into a single package and then easily ship it to whichever environment or system we want to yeah. and the package that we are shipping mm -hmm. or migrating from one system to another that is, that is nothing a called container. but a container awesome yeah. <laughs> good so uh, how does containerization as since you've learned about the legacy <clears throat> right uh, how does containerization actually helps us you know how has it made our life easier yeah okay so see containerization first of all the major advantage that it gives is you know the package has all the system level dependencies and the frameworks and you know the libraries the infrastructure is quite simple mm -hmm. quite basic mm -hmm. and very lightweight also which makes the shipping and the scaling load balancing stuff of mm -hmm. any application mm -hmm. quite simpler and easier yeah so basically the uh, overhead is reduced right yeah exactly. it's, uh, because the, okay, the so infrastructure th overhead is reduced okay yeah. so i think so to understand this better i would like to bring comparison with the legacy virtual machine yeah. right okay so i would like to tell you how the legacy virtual machine uh, technically works how it used to work before containerization existed right so as i told earlier we have the a hardware level right the infrastructure uh, on that we have our hypervisor, hypervisor which helps to enable virtualization now what happens is to <coughs> enable virtualization we have operating systems which are running on the hypervisor that correct? needs its separate resources exactly yeah. so these operating system have booked a certain amount of access so suppose being split equally there's mm. one third of resource to each of the each three of the applications operating, systems, operating yeah. systems right yeah. now these operating systems will also have their own libraries their own binary files right mm. and on this after so much of being set up then we have our application, application. but in terms of uh, uh, what's called containers this uh, is the same is a similar thing where we have the infrastructure we have the uh, we have something called as a docker daemon yeah. correct so docker daemon enables us to create virtualization now the benefit over here is that we don't have an operating system operating system takes up a huge chunk yeah. right instead of operating system directly we have our uh, libraries libraries followed by application, applications right and so there's, there's no dependencies on the operating mm -hmm. system okay. so this can be easily shipped yeah. and moved right? as you know we can also compare whatever you just explained shlok as uh -huh. in we have a hypervisor uh -huh. that creates a connection between the infrastructure and the guest os that we have booted up uh -huh. and the docker daemon which creates you know a connection between the docker containers that we are booting up on that infrastructure uh -huh. directly with the host os okay and the advantage here is that in the first thing that is vm uh -huh. architecture uh -huh. each of the vms or uh -huh. the op 
separate guest hose that we are booting requires its own set of resources. Yeah. But in case of Docker environment, any application that is being booted up mm -hmm. is on the host, uses the resources of the host OS itself. Okay. So if an application is does not require that much memory and there is another bigger container, mm -hmm. it can take resources and use it accordingly. So it's much more efficient basically. Yeah. Eh? Yeah. It's much more smaller. It is yeah. easy to deploy. And resource right? reusable. Resource reusable. Yeah. Awesome. But uh, there's obviously disadvantages with this as well, right? Because uh, if despite container, <coughs> despite Docker and container, Docker containers being so popular, it is not completely abolished the VMs and the legacy servers, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, what are the disadvantages of containers? So the disadvantage that comes in is that even after the fact that you have created an application, mm -hmm. some time goes into containerizing those applications, creating the relative images of those applications. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so suitable amount, amount, amount of time can go in there mm -hmm. because you know what we need to create, we just don't want to create containers. We cre need to create containers that have optimized code in them. Okay. So that shipping becomes easier mm -hmm. as smaller contain, the smaller the container, the easier the shipping becomes. That's right. So this is a disadvantage, increase in development time. Mm -hmm. And also say, if we are, you know, trying to manage the containers on ourselves. Uh -huh. So adds a bit of an infrastructure overhead, as yeah. in you need a separate team, separate mm -hmm. set of individuals to, you okay. know, yeah. carry so, that out. So containerizing each and everything is a tedious process. Yeah. Little right. bit, yeah. Awesome. Cool. So I think so. We've got a good understanding about what containerization is and how we have come from the uh, you know uh, legacy VM architecture to containerization, yeah. right? Awesome. So there are I think so there are certain terminologies which are important to uh, know before we jump into containerization, yeah. right? And so images and containers, containers in general. Can you yeah. please tell me more about what exactly are doc images and containers? Yeah. yeah. People are mostly aware with these two terms: <laughs> only Docker images and no. Docker containers. If there are anything else, please educate yeah. me on that as well. Yeah. So we'll go with a very standard you know definition uh -huh. of what an image and a container. Is. Uh -huh. So uh, let's start with image. Mm -hmm. So whenever we have a code base, mm -hmm. we create a Docker file for that particular service. Of okay. The, okay? Mm -hmm. So whenever we build that particular Docker file, mm -hmm. what we get is an image. Okay. And this image is something that will be shipped that will be shipped to various environments and other systems or any other app environments. Okay. And this image is usually stored and in a central repository okay. be it a docker hub be it your private registry anywhere mm -hmm. and then people can clone that, that particular image, image into then, their system mm -hmm. and then run it and whenever okay. we are running an image then it is called a container container yeah okay awesome uh nice so cool so uh yeah, very well summarized. Uh, awesome. So now, uh, as you told, uh, in different architectures, we'll have containers as well, right? Yeah. So containerization exists. And uh, so as uh, so coming to different architectures, we have obviously the monolith and microservice architecture, which we've spoken extensively about in our previous episodes. Please feel free to check those out. Uh, <laughs> self luck So uh, let's, <coughs> let us let me give a brief introduction of monolith either way. So monolith <coughs> architecture, basically, where we have a common repository for a bare bone example. For multiple right? services. And for multiple services. And microservice architecture, where uh, where all the services are split into separate, they have their own repositories and they communicate via either HTTP requests or a service mesh or then a particular framework, right? So in these certain scenarios, I want to know how containerization works in terms of monolith architecture and in terms of microservice architecture. Okay. Could you please like tell me about yeah. that? So you know, let's first cover monolithic architecture. Yeah. So as you said, monolithic architecture has a single code mm -hmm. base. Mm -hmm. So whenever we create a Docker container of that particular monolithic architecture, uh -huh. it basically consists of all the services. Okay. So as we discussed earlier, the mm -hmm. image or the container that we'll be, we'll be creating mm -hmm. will be of a very large size. Mm -hmm. So as you know, larger the size, it becomes <laughs> difficult to shape. Ship, yeah, the it, build time, build is time is high. Yeah. Uh, to resources move it, are much more. Resources are much yeah. more. Whenever, say for example, there are many services, mm -hmm. Suppose one of the services requires scaling, uh -huh. but that does not happen. Yeah, we so have this entire, entire the, container we have to scale. Yeah, yeah. And it's a very big container. Yeah. So shipping, auto-scaling part becomes a bit of a bottleneck okay. in terms of monolithic architecture. Okay. Monolith easier part is that we only have to create one Docker file. A single image will contain the entire application. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. And in terms of microservices, what we can do is individual services, you know, we can uh, create separate Docker images of, uh -huh. store them in a repository, mm -hmm. clone whichever service we require and run it. Okay. And the fact that say, for example, one of the services 
is receiving high load. Mm-hmm. So we only scale that particular service. We don't need to scale the entire and application. The application. application right. So, you know, resources are saved a lot yeah. whenever we are containerizing a microservice architecture. Okay. Yeah. But difficulty is that only we have a lot of <laughs> lot services, a lot of containers. Yeah, exactly. And if we are, you know, manually trying to handle the infrastructure, it becomes a bit difficult. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of difficulty, I think so there are a lot of difficulty in managing multiple containers and the environments, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. But there are principles <clears> the, <throat> by which we can actually manage them, right? Mm-hmm. So I think so there's something called as a container orchestration, orchestration yeah. right? And there are certain tools which enable us to manage these like so mm-hmm. container orchestration tools which are available yeah. in the market. Yeah. So would you like to please tell me a bit about container orchestration and the tools available for it? Yeah. So basically, uh, what con- is container orchestration? Container yeah. orchestration. Yeah. Container orchestration is, for example, we are handling an infrastructure where there are a number of containers that are booted up. Uh-huh. So we need to, you know, manage when which container goes down mm-hmm. because of the scaling factor that we have set up. Less load is coming. Number of containers have to reduce. Mm-hmm. More number of requests are there. The number of containers have to scale accordingly. Mm -hmm. There are a number of servers there wherein those containers are booted up. Mm -hmm. Uh, How to switch load between those servers, Mm -hmm. which container moves on to which particular server. Mm -hmm. So the process of managing it automatically is known as container orchestration. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think so there are plenty of tools in the market like Kubernetes, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, which handle uh, <coughs> content orchestration. So can you please like tell us a bit more about the tools? Have you used those? Yeah, how yeah, how yeah. has your experience yeah. been? It's how a, was the learning curve like? If actually, uh, Kubernetes, if you're trying to bring up a managed cluster by uh-huh. yourself, uh-huh. then it's a bit of a tedious Okay, so task. before we jump into that, I'd like you to tell what Kubernetes yeah, is. Definitely. Also, yeah, can you please tell a yeah. bit about that? Just because people know. Yeah. So let's cover tools as as a whole mm. so first we'll say kubernetes kubernetes okay. or maybe docker swarm is an alternative uh-huh. what we do is we have a number of servers okay we attach it to one cluster uh-huh. and one of the servers we declare it as master okay. and then we simply go on booting as many containers as we want into that cluster mm-hmm. it is the duty of the kubernetes master or mm-hmm. the docker master mm-hmm. to you know uh, scale uh-huh. the number of containers manage load onto the servers uh-huh. move specific containers to specific number of servers based on the incoming request or the load that we are facing okay so one of this is thing where we have you know servers inside a cluster uh-huh. the other concept that comes up which many of the cloud providers like aws azure provide is a serverless architecture yeah what we do in a serverless architecture <clears throat> is we don't have to manage anything we simply boot our uh, mm-hmm. containers mm-hmm. Uh, give it to the cloud provider mm-hmm. and it is the cloud provider that manages on the back end itself on how the number of containers are increasing mm-hmm. how they are scaling down it mm-hmm. completely is managed by the cloud provider we don't have to do anything mm-hmm. so this is uh, the basic two different types of tools that we are using one that involves servers mm-hmm. and the other being serverless okay yeah awesome so, uh, I think we've wrapped up most of it, but then uh, as you're a DevOps engineer, right? And DevOps basically have the development and the operation cycles of it. And generally, most of the issues which a DevOps uh, process or mm-hmm. faces has been uh, eradicated and been solved by Dockerization, Docker. right? Yeah. The containerization. So, how has basically containers and Docker containers basically helped you in help help ease the de- DevOps cycle? Yeah. yeah. Can you please tell about, yeah. about so, that? Yeah. So, you know, I'll c- cover some of the points yeah, sure. as you said. So, the first one being the major issue that it solved is Docker container can run on any system. Yeah. It does not depend you know that first first of all say for example as you said in vm architecture there are os level dependencies mm. but right now when we are booting up uh, containers because it already has the dependencies in itself mm-hmm. it can run on any system mm. it does it does not depend on the os so the first major problem that it solves mm-hmm. is uh, removing the os level dependency whenever a container is booted up on a system okay uh, La, the second topic uh, that we can cover is say uh, environment standardization. Mm-hmm. For example, there is one Docker, say, uh, Docker container that is running. There mm-hmm. is a one instance of a Docker image on a container registry. Mm-hmm. So, for example, I'm a developer. For example, you are a tester. Mm-hmm. So, environment standardization is there in the development environment. Also, we can use the same Docker image mm-hmm. to boot up a container mm-hmm. on my system. Same goes with you as you are a tester, and mm-hmm. same goes onto maybe a production server on a production environment. Yeah. Environment standardization is there. That is the same kind of code and application is running on all the systems. Exactly. Yeah. So this leads to faster and consistent configuration yeah. as well, right? Definitely. Yeah. 
Also, lower system requirements? Definitely, lower system requirements. As we discussed in microservices, whenever required, we'll scale only some of the services. Mm. Thereby, we are saving a lot of resources. Mm. We also discussed, you know, VMs <laughs> and uh, uh -huh. the container environment. Uh -huh. How not having restricted, isolated environments can help us you know, save resources. Mm. So that is also a major advantage of using Docker, Docker containers, container environments. Also, I think so in terms of uh, uh, ish, uh, when we have downtime, right? So yeah. disaster recovery system. Disaster right? recovery. So can you please tell a bit about that as well? Yeah. So disaster recovery, just, uh, you know, two points also we same we can cover here. Uh -huh. Is that just uh, in terms of microservices, one of the services goes down. Mm -hmm. The other services that we have booted, booted up, uh -huh. uh, does not take a downtime only that particular service is uh, you know facing a downtime uh -huh. apart from that the smaller size uh -huh. uh, the faster portability of these particular docker containers can uh -huh. help us reduce downtime a lot awesome so i think so we have had a quite interesting and uh, in deep depth discussion yeah. about what containerization is uh so uh yeah so i think so let's jump to the final section of our show, the 120 seconds rundown. <laughs> so cool. So uh, this is a section of the show where we try to cover the entire thing that we have covered so far in 120 seconds. And here we go. <laughs> okay. So uh, before we jump into conversation, the legacy systems that existed were, were you uh, was uh, the VM architecture. VMs and servers. Were VMs and servers were virtualization the process by which we can cut, uh, we can distribute a hardware resource among multiple applications. Guest OS. Guest OS, yeah. right? And on this guest OS, we have uh, uh, our applications running. Yeah. Now, the issue is that the application is OS dependent. It is very difficult to share. It's very isolated and resources are very restricted to each of the operating systems. Exactly. So yeah. we cannot uh, move it faster, right? We cannot deploy it in other instances because mm. it's OS dependent. It is very heavy. Mm. It is tightly coupled. And if suppose one application goes down, there's a lot of hardware that is going to use. Use, right. So uh, since many of us wanted a faster boot time and we didn't require an OS dependency for many of our application, this beautiful thing called as uh, Docker, Docker Engine came into place in 2013, which led to the containerization process. Yeah. And containerization is basically the same thing, but we remove the operating system and push everything down, mm -hmm. right? So there's no operating system dependencies and can be booted in a matter of seconds, yeah, right? Resources are also shared between all those containers. Exactly. Yeah. So things that you need to learn, no, to two, two fundamental points are images and uh, containers. containers. So images are basically the config file yeah. which in which shows which tells what are the dependencies, dependencies and what are the uh, commands that we need to run exactly and this can be stored in any server any central uh, you know repository yes and, and this whenever can, we clone it yes. we run it on any system it's called a container container yeah exactly so very easy to deploy easy to move around very quick to learn yeah. right awesome also so uh, advantages it is very easy very uh, small so small in size small so makes size. portability and scaling easier exactly but the disadvantage is that sometimes we do require application which need OS dependencies yeah. that is where that is why VM has not been completely abolished yeah, because sometimes right? we need isolation of those applications exactly yeah so uh, apart from that uh, so uh, use, the usage of these are in microservice and monolith architecture and monolith architecture the down the downtime the, the issues with what this is is that the entire application, application is inside one, one container. container exactly bigger container difficult to ship simple smaller and microservices smaller container Easier, easier to shift, to... portable and exactly. scalable. But since there are multiple services, multiple contents to maintain, that's yeah. a downside of that. Yeah, infrastructure uh, overhead. Exactly. So yeah. because there's so much uh, infrastructure overhead and managing things of managing the dockers is difficult, we have open orchestration, orchestration tools. tools. And orchestration tools includes service, serverless. One, one, that one that is serverless. And Kubernetes. Kubernetes. Yeah. And then uh, basically containers have helped ease life of our fellow <laughs> DevOps engineers like Aditya. <laughs> and uh, that's about it. Yeah. So, Thank you, thank you, Aditya. It has been a really insightful yeah. and an amazing thank session you so with you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, for joining. I hope you had a wonderful session. I hope you guys got to learn about containerization and containers. And uh, we'll see you next week on another episode of the talk show. I'm your host, Shlokjit, signing off. Bye bye.